Hello there, and welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinger, and this is episode number 422. That's cuatro, dos, dos of the Agassino Zinger Show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to hear. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. Make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. Turn on that notification bell and share the show with all your family and friends. And of course, if you're listening via the Patreon app or the sorry, the podcast app, actually, leave me a five star review and share it with your friends. And support via Patreon is always more than welcome. You can support the podcast via Patreon on patreon.com for just Agostino. That's patreon.com for just Agostino. You get one bonus show on Patreon only for my Patreon members. You can subscribe for as little as one dollar, that's one pound equivalent per month to get access to my patreon and you'll get that exclusive bonus show only available there for my patreon backers so make sure you jump on there asap because that bonus show is coming to you very very soon but yeah how are you guys doing man how's the vibe good good to know how am i you know doing the best that i can with the time that i have available as per usual what have i been doing lately i've been watching a bunch of movies um I've been watching a bunch of movies, a bunch of documentaries I'm going to cover on here. Blah, 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 blah. What else have I been doing? Movies, documentaries, do, 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 do. Reading as well, reading, that's it, yeah. So I've been reading this. I've been checking out Michelle Holbeck's Serotonin, a novel by the famed um, what public intellectual, right? Or philosopher of some sorts, I don't know how you'd kind of categorize Michelle Welbeck. But yeah, um pretty decent novel to begin with. I've just gotten through the first kind of half of it as you can tell, or the first quarter, as you can tell via the camera if you're watching there. So um yeah, pretty decent read, if not just a little bit um what I said this <laughs> it's a little bit unbelievable not unbelievable, but it's hard to um it's hard to believe some of the stories that Michelle Welbeck tells about his encounters with the females when you consider how ugly he looks right objectively not to be completely mean it's quite difficult to kind of picture him being that seductive being that alluring being that attractive to women of the opposite sex but i'd imagine somebody with a brain the size of his and also the french persuasion maybe he's got something about him right he's got that je ne sais quoi that just makes the girls go crazy but it's pretty funny to read anyway because it's just an entire novel of his kind of vulgar creepy so, no, he's somewhat vulgar creepy outlooks on life which are very much so centered around uh, positions, status, relationships, and uh, power dynamics. It's a bit weird. So um, it's, it's all right. It's a decent book. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to probably go through um, uh, the rest of his books and kind of get inundated with that. But that's been good. What else? Um, I found this new YouTube channel called Knowledgeia. Knowledgeia, yeah, Knowledgeia, that I watch alongside the Kings and Generals. It's sort of like a history channel sort of stuff that I kind of check out. That's really, really, really good. I recommend you check that out if you're into learning about our history. I've been learning about why some of the Nazis decided to seek refuge to Argentina after the World War Two, And that's been pretty eye-opening to see um, basically you know they had a lot of uh, uh sympathetic folk out there they kind of traveled or bypassed through parts of italy and spain and stuff so that kind of undercuts or explains some of the reasons why you have a lot of um you know fascist segments and right-wing parties rising up in those countries you know they've got a real long history of kind of aligning themselves with that sort of kind of politic with that politics to be completely precise so that's been pretty eye-opening to check out and just a whole bevy of stuff you know whole slew of stuff the standard stuff that i kind of keep myself abreast on but i'm trying my best to kind of wean myself off of um keeping abreast or keeping an eye on all the news the covid news specifically i don't really think i'm gaining or yeah, i'm not gaining anything from checking out that covid news it's not really benefiting me in any way shape or form if anything it's making my life worse because what ends up happening is if they can't get you if they can't scare you into you know in action if they can't you know rally you up then they'll just start talking about other places that are open and living life as per normal and that of course is going to end up depressing you so i just try to pull away from that in general and just try to focus on you know um reading doing the things i need to do and just kind of keeping away from all that bibbly crap because no one wants to put myself in a situation where you know you're getting riled up about these dumb things it's not it's not necessary it's not necessary not necessary so yeah that's what i've been doing so i, I recommend 
a few of you if you've if you're kind of down in the dumps and you're not really feeling it try your best to sort of give yourself a little bit of a break try a couple of days like I did five days consistently I'm not checking the news at all and it really um helped my mood it helped my overall mental psyche and just allowed me to have time to you know read watch documentaries watch movies and kind of detach myself from the rigors of reality that are going on because at the moment we have we have a vaccine right um they're just rolling out at the moment they're trying to obviously up um the amount of people that get vaccinated to a level that would allow us to open the economy to some regard but until then we just have to wait it out and it's a waiting game it is what it is it's a waiting game anyway loads of topics to get into loads of things i've kind of stumbled across on the internet that i want to speak to you guys about so if you've got yourself a lovely drink and something to nibble on grab a hold of it and let's dive on deep in the show i've got myself a nice big mug of tea with a couple dashings of honey so here we go number one topic to get into um this is a bit of an old video this was um i think this kind of made the rounds last year um it went a bit viral but i rewatched it again today and i just couldn't help so i couldn't help laughing at the entitlement of it all especially when you consider some of the other stuff that i've been covering here about um covid deniers deciding to go to target and cause a ruckus and stuff and this is basically in the same sort of field so for the podcast listeners um there's a young lady who's a doordash um delivery driver she ends up delivering some food for a customer and then I guess gets upset because the tip that she receives she deems to be um less than what she deserves for the service that she'd done and how far she traveled and then they get into a bit of an altercation because the customer has one of those ring um doorbell things where you can you know remotely speak to the person via the video whatever camera they have on that ring alarm so I'm pretty sure it's not in the house if, if you have ring do you do you use it if you're in the house and you can't both to get up is that what you do or do you just use it if you're not around I imagine if you're not around, right? I don't know. Who knows? But regardless, um, she comes back after receiving the tip and just all hell breaks loose. So let's watch the clip. It's incredibly funny. Driver man. How you believe it, thank you. <laughs> He's telling her he can leave in. I'm guessing she's ringing the doorbell in order to kind of get his attention to argue about the tip that she just received. I can speak to you, actually. Jesus Christ. Sorry? <laughs> I need to speak to you. I don't think you realize where they're coming from, so I need to speak to you. <laughs> where what's coming from? Where the food you ordered is coming from. I don't think you realize the distance that it's come from because then you would never actually have given what you gave so the funny thing is about this or the funny and so also tragic part of this is if service workers were just paid a minimum wage to begin with they've avoided all these problems but then on the other hand having listened to a few restaurant based food podcasts they argue that the tipping system is actually part of the reason why the service in some states in america is so good because they kind of pride themselves on being um i guess somewhat professionals at their job there are people that actually you know have a career um in in the service industry whether it's being a waiter uh maitre d uh front of house sous chef whatever they are actually spend their entire lives there whereas i guess in the uk depending on what place you go to there are a lot of people who are just basically using it as like a stepping stone for other things or as a stopgap or as something just to pay the bills just like you know working in a shoe store but there's an argument to be had that because because the money's so low in terms of base salary only somebody that's really committed to working within the restaurant industry or within the service industry would want to work there right you'd what you don't want to go there just because you want to pay the bills because it's not enough so once you spend you know five or so years there and you've kind of you know had put your feet under the table you You've gained a little bit of experience you know what you're doing um you maybe have progressed in the company it makes sense to just hang around and just you know um, use your skills for good and obviously allow you to maybe make some extra money as you kind of slowly but surely creep up the ladder but there's also this understanding between the customers that these people aren't being paid a minimum wage so there's this weird kind of um tension or game that's going on right where you're trying to 
ensure that you have the best experience so you can give them a tip and they're trying to make sure they provide the best service for you so you can give them the tip it's a strong little tension going on there but then that all gets thrown out the window when it comes to delivery service um delivery apps right because they've essentially undercut a lot of restaurants they've also kind of um I guess they've also sort of moved the goalposts in terms of what service is. They've maybe redefined it. Um, maybe customers' expectations aren't as high as they need to be. But then if you're coming from a restaurant place and you've got that experience, you've, you're kind of taking that same mindset to delivery and whatever it may be, you might be a little bit perturbed to find that most people, when you get do get something delivered to you, number one, a lot of people that are ordering delivery are trying to order on the cheap. I don't know why, but it's a fair enough. I've done it myself. You're trying to spend under a certain amount. You don't want to spend more. The only weird place, the only time that I actually want to spend more and actually leave a tip is when I actually go to an actual restaurant, right? Because I enjoy, I want to enjoy the ambiance. I want to be able to, I don't know. There's a weird thing, especially in the UK, where you tend to, you tend to spend, I guess you tend to kind of sometimes uh, subconsciously try and spend a lot more money when you're sitting down so that you can be allowed, so that you can be left alone. Because there's sometimes a little bit of a thing where people try to rush you out of your seat, if, especially if it's a busy restaurant, you might have an hour and a half window and then that's it. So if you're able to kind of, you know, make nice with the waiters and the waitresses and the bartenders and someone in the toilet, whatever it may be, right? You can maybe finagle an extra hour or so sitting down on your table. So it's kind of a bit different there, but... I just again I think I just see sadness in this person's eyes I just see somebody that's obviously going through something to decide to come back to a place where you probably dropped off what a burger and some fries because you didn't get the tip that you wanted and then to argue with it through, with somebody via a flipping ring camera that's like big yikes so I think you can come and face to face because I drove 40 minutes I drove 40 minutes and it was extremely far and I got it to you early so I don't think you realize where you work from I'm not, I don't understand <laughs> um, well, I think from where from the restaurant that you ordered from do you realize how far it is do you realize you ordered from Carmack and you're in Smithtown that's a 15-20 minute drive it's not. You need to try to drive it. I just drove it. It's 40 minutes. It's, it's 12 and a half miles. And then I think somebody in the comments said something like, oh, they've actually calculated themselves on Google Maps or something. And it was actually like an 11 minute journey. So even less than what she said. So she's clearly going through it. You know, when, when somebody's arguing of an $8 tip, you know, there's some sort of pain and struggle going there. It's just unfortunate. It's just really funny too. The customer has no idea what she's talking about. He's so detached from the situation. He's like, what? He's, you know, because, you know, when you're ordering something with his places, when, when, it, when it arrives, you're not thinking about, you know, the well-being of the person that's delivering it to you. They've, they've you know, they look pretty well to do. They've handed you your item and you just kind of turn, switch off and you kind of continue thinking about the rest of your day. So he's trying to have to, like, get himself back into the mindset of, like, thinking, hold on, what did I order? How much did I get? Where did, where did it come from? Right? You've already, you've already forgotten where you order your food from. You're just ready to eat and move on. And she's having to kind of rehash this story in order to kind of pull out his harsh strings, kind of guilt shame him into giving her more money. But then the more that he speaks and the more that she speaks, sorry, the more that he starts to remember where he actually ordered it from. He's like, hold on, you're taking me for a mug. So I don't think you realize how far it is. So but I think you have to pick up if you think it's that far. <laughs> I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying that you have to pick up if you think it's that far. So I think you need to adjust your tip. Jesus Christ. To make it right. How much of the tip? You gave an eight dollar tip. What the hell are you looking for? <laughs> I, gave an I love it. What the hell are you looking for? I gave eight dollar tip. What else do you want? Twenty bucks? Like what? Okay, I'm gonna bring the food back. I'm gonna bring the food back. Okay. What? Is she fucking kidding? Oh my god. <laughs> but oddly enough too i i bet you any money a decent person would also feel kind of guilty you know as much as she's an absolute psychopath 
you'd also kind of feel a little bit guilty that you're having to put this person through this. It's not your fault, of course, but you just, especially during COVID, you know, everyone's struggling, everyone's going through it. You don't know if she had another job before this, if she's balancing five or seven jobs. You have no idea where her history is, but regardless, somebody's arguing over an $8 tip is definitely hurting in some regard. But yeah, I thought that was hilarious, man. And <laughs> I didn't pay much attention to it when it first kind of went viral, but I saw it again on my timeline and I thought, you know what, I've got to speak about this. This is ridiculous. <laughs> oh, and in more um, interesting news I found on the interwebs, a whole group of UK influencers for some reason are trying to justify their exotic getaways during the pandemic, which is a complete contrast to some of the stuff that you might have seen from their US counterparts, especially some of the TikTok kids who have kind of spent the best part of the last six months throwing as many birthday parties as they can for each other going to random steak restaurants and just living it up in it just living it up and they were doing this prior to rapid testing being as cheap as it is now right i think they've kind of improved the processes or other companies have come into the fray but prior to the kind of landscape that's out there at the moment getting a test done especially a rapid test cost a bit of money it was like a hundred dollars plus right now i'm sure you can get one for under 50 bucks so they were doing that consistently getting themselves tested so they can just go and rave and sometimes not getting themselves tested and um you know even though they got you know absolute pelts online from people and horrible comments from randoms and whatever it may be they just continue doing it in the face of all that backlash and it's quite admirable to be honest right not giving an absolute single fuck at that age multi-millionaire living with all your friends you know um passing around covid and you know numerous other stds and stis and then deciding to just travel all around the world and all of your state and all of your country wherever it might be open and just enjoy living up life but i guess the uk influencers have a little bit more shame maybe a little bit more of a conscious um they may be uh they might actually be decent people underneath all the glitz and glamour so they kind of decided to go to the guardian and kind of you know um make their case for why they think going on all these exotic trips during the pandemic is number one ethical or morally correct which again i don't think they owe anyone an explanation like i said i'm i'm well far I think I mentioned it a few times, maybe some, you know, jokingly with the stuff about nasty and some of the play graves. I'm not annoyed by any of this stuff. I think it's quite humorous. If anything, I wish I had the courage to go to some of these play graves, but I don't really have it. You know, I've decided that I take the virus seriously. So I'm staying indoors and not really traveling that much. And it is what it is. But I'm also not going to chastise people who decide to do the complete opposite of me because, you know, who are you going to listen to? Um, the government who have kind of royally fucked up um, every kind of response on every sort of level and essentially just stumble their way into a vaccine that they're still not getting correct in terms of rolling that out so you know i completely understand i i don't you know it's not something i'll do myself but i can understand the psyche that would make somebody think you know what i've got these million followers i need to make some content i'm bored here let's go to dubai let's be having it drink some you know drinks that are covered in flammable highly flammable flames and then keep on going this is the article here from the guardian it says hard graft uk influencers scramble to justify exotic getaways in pandemic and you've got a cast of people and again it's hard for me because i don't know none of these people because i don't watch reality tv not to be like you know oh i'm a big boy i don't watch reality tv but it's just not my vibe so i'd much rather just watch other things but i have no idea who these people are but i guess they're pretty famous um you know massive massive breasts tight jeans tight t-shirt in a seductive face you know to stand the social media shit so he continues his article in ordinary times influencers posting from dubai go out of their way to show you what good time they're having in covid's latest crew reversal they are now doing everything they can to show that they are working their socks off <laughs> with the rising number of cases leading to the uk to announce that the united arab emirates will be removed from its travel corridor list on tuesday oh really i didn't know that british nationals are returning home now to face 10 days of isolation and in the aftermath of that announcement by the uk transport secretary grant Shapps, social media users have realized that an extraordinary number of their former stars and tv series love island and Jordy shaw appear to be at present in the uae which you know is what it is i guess most more than likely we're going to be what did they say they said they're going to review the, the national lockdown we have at the moment uh second week of february so it's going to be probably around the valentine's weekend or valentine's week and then most likely restrictions will be eased at the beginning of March. So if that's the case and these guys make a living, you know, posting numerous pictures of themselves in mirrors, wearing nice clothes, on balconies, overlooking the city skyline, you know, drinking drinks with sparklers in it. You might as well go to Dubai. There's no better place for all that glitzy 
um, you know, nouveau rich um, kind of lifestyles um, to be showcasing on your social media because you can't do it here because, you know, Soho is not open. It continues here. Some of these exiled influencers are posting the same sun lounges and posh dinner contests as before. Our oh, content, sorry, Dubai is not subject to a lockdown measures in the, like the UK, but now they are having to scramble to delete the hostile messages ensuing from their followers. With essential work trips being one of the very few occasions consistently allowed justification to travel, as the UK rules have been fluctuated over the last few months, some of the influencers in Dubai are trying to indicate that their 3,400 mile trip was necessary part of their work, appearing in videos paid for endorsements, which which, look man it's a it's a mad world isn't it because i think the brands themselves who are willing to pay influencers money to you know market things during a pandemic they're obviously companies that you probably wouldn't want to endorse anyway because i guess this would probably be the worst time to do any kind of paid advertising especially hard sell um during this pandemic i think at the beginning probably online shopping numbers were soaring i'm not sure they're where they should be now in terms of numbers i don't think a lot of people are actually selling as much as they say they're selling i'm sure a lot of people are saving their money waiting for you know things to be relaxed so they can book trips to go anywhere but to stay here to go anywhere but be here so i can understand that being a thing but they're all gonna also i can understand for an influencer with your lack of income because a lot of these brands are basically you know tightening up their budgets because they're letting go of staff members and whatnot the first thing having worked in marketing t departments for various companies the first thing to go when you're trying to tighten your budget is the is the spend that you you know allocate to influencers right any kind of third party things they completely go out the window especially when you try and tighten the budget you first try and get rid of staff because you know there's usually a big expenses in terms of salary and then next goes marketing spend and then from there you know you know how the game goes it continues as a reaction built up on wednesday the love island star anton din look whoever that is danny look maybe that's the kind of picture who has been in dubai since 10th of december and has posted an image of himself out for meals and smoking shisha and a pool shared a video of his laptop with a view of the skyline behind it and a caption that says love my new office or love my office view hilarious meanwhile the only s the only way is essex star james Locke posted at least two images of his laptop with unspecified graphs on screen <laughs> with his story so what did he just load up a window with like google sheets and just decided to like copy and paste a couple of graphs <laughs> on wednesday morning he told his followers he and his girlfriend yasmin okaluka o okaleho um were working away despite what you think we are still grafting he posted a video of himself sunbathing with a drink and no laptop an hour later of course grafting absolutely hilarious okaleku the girlfriend also an influence had previously explained that the Dubai trip was for an unavoidable product launch. We are here for work purposes, for business. Obviously, we'll make the most of it while we're here as well. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it, how Dubai has turned into like Magaluf, isn't it? At first, Dubai used to be a location where a lot of people, especially Brits, tended to like avoid because British people tend to have an, a tendency or a preference to indulge in class A substances, which, you know, you'd imagine parts of the Middle East are not too keen on either. And if you do indulge in such things, you probably get chucked into a prison and spend, what was it, 69, 99 nights, like um, Futures DJ, um, DJ Esco, when you got locked up for taking some hashish with him so it's not the best place to go if you're a brit right and you're you know you're into your sniff and your kit and all this other stuff that you want to do so it's interesting that these same people who you'd assume would be a little bit you know into those recreational activities will be deciding it's not recreational is it it's kit recreational i don't know regardless you do it's just interesting to see that now you know fast forward during covid times it's now turned into like the quasi mallorca it's like you know mallorca 2.0 to go to it's very very bizarre very very odd but it kind of makes sense and if you're a love island geordie shore type of person and you like you know skimpy outfits and tight jeans and tight t-shirts it's probably the best place to go to in it because they're quite opulent and brash in that way there's sort of a lot of um similarities and differences right they're very similar and very different i guess middle east kind of new rich new rich uh new money peeps are sort of similar to that kind of chavy working class person too right they like to show um you know they like to find the things in life and all that good stuff the only thing that's different i guess their bodies you know middle eastern men don't bother getting six packs they just you know waddle around with their pot bellies and gucci loafers and pay for girls to 
you know, allegedly shit on their chest. And it continues. Um, they're far from alone. The Judy Shaw stars Chloe Ferry, Sophie Casey, and Beth Ann Kershaw. None of these people I know said the apartment they had rented had a room devoted to producing sponsored content. Shit. So these guys are flying these girls out to go and post selfies of themselves on balconies of apartment buildings. For what reason? So you can book the... I wonder what that does, actually. Does that mean if you're a fan of the show that you follow these people and then they tag the location of where they're staying and then you want to stay in that same hotel or same apartment building? So, um, Gabby Allen, another Love Island, um, another Love Islander has told her followers, hey guys, just to let you know, hey guys, just to let you know, you made, uh, we made the decision to fly to Dubai as my boyfriend's business is based here and luckily allowed us to travel. Oh yeah, cool, boyfriends. Um, others have told, others, well, others could have traveled before the UK ban on non-essential gestural journeys was imposed in November. The Love Island star Kaz Crossley has been there since October and her agent said was therefore a resident rather than a tourist. The same claim made by fellow Islander Georgia Harrison. So everyone is suddenly a Middle East resident, right? Interesting, isn't it? Just let's see how quickly these people move when Spain and Portugal and parts of France open up in Italy. Let's see how quickly these guys move over and suddenly rescind their... Uh, uh, middle eastern citizenship it continues here um extraordinary proliferation of workaholic influences in dubai taking refuge even as the coronavirus case hits rises led the writer calvin martin to describe the emirates hotspot as the covid casablanca that's pretty funny and um, residents might welcome their city's popularity with british tourists in general but some are unimpressed by a latest deluge he says here with all them coming in getting reservations at attractions and slots of residents have been difficult said ria matthew a social care so executive she said that the problem was a specifically british one and coincided with the rising case count in the uae oh our city became so over full overnight things are good good and then boom tourists everywhere things are escalating here and it's scary uae government said it cited significant acceleration of the number of imported cases the, so all these influencers are coming over these quote-unquote workaholic imagine calling yourself a workaholic influencer is there anything more repulsive like part of the reason you want to be an influencer is so you don't have to work right you don't you don't decide to be an influencer so you can graft nine to five right you want to do as little as possible for as much as you can um and enjoy your life right that's basically what you want to be an influencer you are allergic you are somewhat disgusted by the idea of actually working on something a project part of a team in a very demanding job in a very demanding sector you don't want that you just want to sun around take pictures with your iphone use your little camera light and keep it moving so to describe yourself as a workaholic influencer so like gay, 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 gay? i don't know the influencer's defense laura anderson another love island veteran who's in dubai said the following i saw someone in my comments saying you're on holiday but you're working and you're not on holiday i'm definitely not out and about every day as i need to be on my laptop working and life here is strict it's funny that they keep saying this laptop 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 it's, it's, it reminds me of like have you ever been have you ever checked out like have you ever done those what are those videos called? Have you ever seen those videos of influencers on YouTube that do those videos of like, oh, a day in my life. This is my day in my life. And they always start off with like, you know, having a tea or some sort of green juice, um, taking in the sun, meditating, writing in my journal. And then it's like um, going through emails, working, working on my laptop, going through emails, like going through emails and working. That's not, you can do that on your phone when you're taking a shit. That's not working. Replying to requests for sponsorships. You get a, you get an inbound request coming. You open the email, you check out the project, products on the person's signature. You see if you like it or not. And then you, you, you decide to respond if you like it and you don't respond if you don't like it they go on as if like they're i don't know crafting a 3d model in cad or something it's like doing going through emails and it always sat on a laptop like typing away like you know it's the most um strenuous job in the world that they're writing some sort of novel that's always hilarious that's what it reminds you of there's so many mentions of laptops here it continues but olivia atwood uh, yeah another love island summarize her such arguments um uh deriviously what dericiously What's that? How do you say that word? Arguments derisively. I don't know how you say that word. Um, I'm going dumb today. It said, it's the constant I'm working, not on holiday shout. She said in the video, there's a difference between being able to earn money wherever you are and being there for work. With scrutiny of the reality stars intensifying trendy travel, a holiday company that specializes in using celebrities to advertise said it had been forced to stop posting anything featuring influencers. Imagine following a page called Trendy Travel or taking any of their advice. 
people are oh my god yuck it's chief executive keith herman said the company had advised about 15 influencers it works with who are in dubai against posting at the moment he said most have listened to us we've told them the world has changed over the last two weeks you've got to be more sensitive to who's seeing your post in his in their defense he said some of the contracts to honor and inexperienced but he said morally they should just lie low at the moment obviously they should but should they anyway i don't know if they should if you have the means again no, part of the annoying thing with this kind of issue is that they're sort of trying to feign um they're trying they're, try, they're kind of trying to feign humility right they're trying to seem somewhat uh relatable but you're not relatable you're in a hit reality tv show which a lot of people watch in this country so they're very well known um, they probably, you know, earn a lot of money, I'm guessing, based on episodes, I don't know, don't watch the show, haven't done any research on how how they make their money, but I'd assume like most reality TV people, you get probably a, a set amount, you get paid for the actual show itself, you might get more as you progress in the show, you might get more as you come out based on deals and brand associations, and then as you get a career and you start to get your feet under the table, it starts to kind of go up, and then of course more brands get involved, blah, 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 but there's no doubt in anyone's mind that you're an affluent person, now they've probably seen and plus reality tv shows they get to see you from when you come quote unquote into their consciousness to when you leave said reality tv show and you start to move around and they get to see the kind of glow up so they know exactly how much money you're sort of accumulating throughout your journey they see the different you know colors and the different backgrounds on your pictures maybe different cars and friends and shit so this whole idea that you need to kind of lay low it's like why lay low we know you drive a rolls royce to the shops you know what i mean like we know you wear a gucci north face um to pop into tesco's or something like this is not new news to us so this whole laying low thing is very very bizarre like no one's under any illusion that these people are multi-millionaires or maybe thousandaires you know what i mean that's just the fact of life sarah penny head of content at the marketing agency influencer intelligence influencer intelligence trendy travel these places sound like the sound like hell on earth to be at imagine working at a place called trendy travel or influencer intelligence god damn it said that such posts were ill-advised even from a branding standpoint she said we've been monitoring the situation throughout the pandemic and it's clear that the audiences are very sensitive to people's behavior i completely understand they have to work but it's very blinkered short-term way of looking at it influencers themselves meanwhile were not too keen to expand their social media statements of the of the 23 contacted by the guardian only cross agency provided a statement on their behalf 21 did not respond while then looks agent arcs influencer would receive a fee <laughs> amazing they would only reply back if they got a fee i love these people man they are the best but yeah um, influencers in the uk are feeling guilty and explaining themselves for some reason i don't know but hey ho what can you do oh this is a good one yeah let's go for this so i watched the comedy store documentary um a few weeks ago and it's really good really really good documentary i kind of definitely understood a, a main reason why a lot of those people that i kind of listened to in the la comedy scene you know suck that store off so much it really makes sense what you watch the documentary it's very well done if not maybe a little bit it's a, it's maybe a little it's maybe references too many celebrities and whatever there may be it probably doesn't um, speak too much to the contemporary side or the modern day in incarnation of the comedy store but it does basically lay out a good timeline of its inception its rise its sort of fall its rise again and basically where it's at, at the moment because i think the last episode is especially it's basically them sitting around and talking about how they've basically dealt with comedy during covid time so it's pretty interesting and they've got everyone on there right everyone that you kind of associate with the comedy store and um, watching it though one specific thing stood out especially from episode four onwards was the story about carlos mencia and the whole issue about him being a joke thief at the comedy store the kind of confrontation that he had with joe rogan that eventually left to a big rift in the store and joe rogan essentially quitting and the store picking carlos mencia over him and that kind of causing a rift in the scene a rift so much that 15 14 years later down the line there's still a little bit of tension behind the scenes regarding what happened and of course Charles Mencia is not featured in the documentary which is an interesting creative interesting production choice I guess or whatever that you call that right interesting because in the documentary no spoiler alert the guy who does it 
he's basically an old comic who kind of quit and decided to do um, directing instead and he's a very um, accomplished director in his own regard um, he he does interview people like Louis C.K. right which is interesting because you know Louis C.K. has kind of got cancelled so he included him in there which was great to see I would have liked to have seen someone like a Chris D'Elia in a documentary as well I think he's um, he kind of represents another era another stage of the of the documentary but I understand at the time it was being made maybe it was just too hot of a time but it would have been great to include him in there um but the one thing that i was surprised about was that you know throughout the entire episode where they speak about the whole issue about cosmic seer and seeing jokes and the joe rogan fallout there wasn't really any mention about cosmic seer side of things they played a little clip of cosmic seer kind of quasi defending himself on a mark Marin podcast one of his catalog of car crash interviews but he never actually appeared in the show himself and i kind of watched it thinking you know what i bet you wherever this guy is he's gonna be really annoyed about this isn't it because you know he's he's never seemed very remorseful throughout the entire process of the time you've heard people speaking about on different shows about how much it kind of drew a rift in the scene and it made people you know relationships got ruined from it but whenever you heard cosman sia speak about the issue he doesn't really seem that remorseful if anything he he kind of avoids apologizing he does that kind of narcissistic um psychopathic thing where he kind of deflects everything and inadvertently makes it all about himself and tries to make you feel sorry for his position just a really strange manipulative kind of behavior so that kind of happened right and then luckily the other day guess what happened oddly enough tiger belly bobby lee's podcast with kalila he decided to get carlsman see on his show to interview him and basically to speak to him about that whole issue and kind of have a bit of an intervention and guess what it didn't work he is exactly the same as you have would have guessed from all the other shows he's done prior he's still unrepentful he's still trying to make excuses for whatever he done and i think once you watch the comedy stock documentary and once you kind of get yourself up to speed with the sort of the unofficial history from some of the other comedians if you've been listening to some of the podcast you will understand that a lot of the reasons why he kind of got excommunicated even though he thinks he didn't do anything wrong and he didn't steal da, 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 is basically because he is a terrible person forget the joke stealing i think the joke stealing was kind of the thing that pushed people over the edge but i think in general as a human he seemed to be a really bad guy and everyone was happy and and kind of glad that joe sort of stood up for them all um in terms of the joke stealing stuff and basically said hey enough is enough you're ruining this place and eventually he did ruin it it kind of died a slow death and it kind of went where he went to but that being said put to one side the actual interview itself with bobby lee and kalila is fascinating to watch with carlos mencia i'm going to play a, a bit of the clip that i kind of pulled out of the stuff that i thought was interesting essentially he's unrepentful he kind of makes excuses and again it's a it's a bit of a hard one to kind of get through because you know it's kind of cringy and you kind of feel embarrassed for him that he's still making excuses now and he still doesn't see the error of his ways but you really have to commend bobby lee for trying his best to try and kind of help his friend somebody that he kind of is a friend because you know bobby lee always speaks very highly of Carlos Mencia. he's the one that kind of gave him a shot brought him on a road he kind of owes a lot to him and he also kind of feels guilty because he also jumped ship when everyone kind of you know distances off of Carlos Mencia. he also kind of jumped on the winning team but you know he's been fairly honest about being a little bit of a um of a wimp in that regard and not really standing up for people in that instance which is fine but i think he was went out of his way to be like you know what let me try and rectify this issue and get him back in the fold because from what you realize watching a comedy store documentary comedians really really value the relationships they have with their peers it's one of the biggest things you hear them mention it all the time like he or, he or she killed on the stage but they always speak about the giggles they heard behind the curtains the giggles they heard in the green room making so-and-so comedian laugh that person coming up to them and saying you did a great set they really really value that so for bobby lee to decide to bring him on the show it was kind of his way of saying that hey i know you're out there in the wilderness on your own and to do this comedy thing you need to be around other comedians this is the only way this makes it fun there's no point of doing this thing if you're just going to be on your own with no friends and you know Carlos just doesn't take it he just kind of sits there makes excuses dunks all over the place kalila tries to come in and it's funny because i guess bobby lee starts off a bit softly softly and then it doesn't work to kind of get him to maybe admit his wrongs and apologize. Then Kalila tries her softly, softly approach. That doesn't work either. And then Bobby Lee tries to be a bit direct about it. And that still doesn't work. It's a complete horror show. But let me just play for you a clip that I thought was pretty illuminating as to the entire issue. It should be around 47 minutes about here. Where is it? About there. Yeah, let's play from here. There you go. 
This is Cosman C on a Tiger Belly podcast, episode number 279. Something that I would say after I told them, I'd rather watch you bomb doing new shit right now. Mm-hmm. Because then I know you're trying something. Because I already know you're funny. You already know you're funny. You're killing with this other set. Now write something different, better, greater. Like come up with something. Yeah. So it was always. A- it's funny. Look at Bobby Lee's face. Like he's a pretty cool dude, man. But he had the same face for the entire podcast. Like whenever they were talking, and he's obviously trying to you know speak about comedy and be normal. But it's like, look, this is just an elephant in the room, you know. About trying to trying to help out, but it, it didn't always it didn't always work. Out <laughs> yeah, <that way>. yeah. <laughs> um. So. So how are you feeling now with all this, the, the controversy that happened a decade ago? I mean, what's what's going on now? 14 years ago now. 14 yeah. years ago, yeah. Uh, see, dude, back in those days, well, first of all, you know what, dude? Everything, it's it hit me uh, when I watched the episode, that episode of, of the Comedy Store. Yeah, the- as soon as this happened, I already knew he was going to talk a lot of bullshit because you'd imagine at this point, someone would just say, you know, how, how, how do you even feeling being like kind of abandoned by your entire community and ostracized and labeled as a joke thief? And basically, you know, this kind of, it's essentially being labeled as a scum of the earth. You'd be like, you know what? It's been really difficult. I have to be honest. I've had some really dark times, but I just want to take this opportunity to just apologize to everybody that I kind of hurt along the way. I don't know how much you don't know how sorry I am for the stuff that I've done and whatever I can do to kind of get back to your good graces, I will do it. But I'm so, so sorry for everything that I've done. And it really hit me. It really hit me when I watched the episode of the comedy store of the damage that I caused in the community. And I don't want everyone to think that I'm a bad guy. I really want to come make amends. That's what someone would say, but look what he says. The showtime thing. Yeah. It hit me because you texted me. I realized I like, my absence from the my? internet in all those years allowed a narrative to be created that will never change. Me, no me, what I me, do, me, me, no me. No matter me. what I say, no matter how I come about it, no matter what my perspective is, um, it, it just is the way it is. Like, there's nothing I could do about it. And that that is a very uh, difficult thing to do for somebody who is a control freak like me. Look, at who, as you know, me? I'm always thinking about me? if I do this, then that, then what are the ramifications I? of all this stuff? Mm-hmm. So my my biggest regret is back in those days, you know, when when all this stuff happened was to to fight it, not fight it, but to like I've recorded all my shows since 1993. Yeah. I don't have to fight anybody. On Excuses. Anything. If somebody comes up to me and says, hey, you're doing my joke, I could easily go. What joke is it? When did you tell it? Let me go look, and then if you did it before me, I'm, I'll stop doing it or whatever it is. See, he nearly said I'm sorry, but he said I'll stop doing it, whatever. That isn't whatever. That's probably one of the biggest crimes that you could ever do in stand-up comedy is copy somebody else's act. That's it, right? There's a lot of comments here about, you know, hear people talking bad about Hannah Gatsby and this type of people because, you know, admitted, admittedly, you know, objectively, it's not comedy. It's not very funny. Or you look at stuff that some of the stuff that these TikTok people do, whatever. You can say, hey, it's not my kind of comedy. But there's no denying that they're kind of creating their own content. It might not be great. It might be regurgitated. It might be a bit hacky. But at least they're making their own content. They're going out of their way to film bits, edit it, put it together, upload it. But when you just sat there, especially prior to the internet, right? Prior to social media picking off and you're kind of exploiting and taking advantage of people. Because especially imagine, imagine back then when having a TV deal, having a name on the marquee, industry friends, all this stuff was super important. So you were basically put on a pedestal and exalted probably higher to a higher level than your actually talent permitted it right because there was no other avenue to be famous or to have a how to have any meaningful success in the industry so he took advantage of that stole people's jokes more so stole openers people that he was kind of you know uh quote unquote grooming people that were kind of new in the industry taking their jokes people that have just kind of getting their feet um under the table and then now years later he still doesn't see the error of his ways like i've always had that yeah but But i stayed quiet and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and now it's just like that's what it is i mean i guarantee you that when this airs you go on to the comments people are gonna say why'd you put that stealing piece of shit on all this kind of stuff whatever it is and no matter what i say but why not but ned why not do in the beginning um just a blanket apology. But I wasn't. See, let me get this. L- understand. Understand what happened. Anytime. Again. 
there's no need to say anything here. Someone's telling you, a comedian within your a fellow peer, someone you respect, somebody who has the ear and the voice of everybody else that's around you that probably would be upset, is kind of telling you via proxy that, hey, the things that you did were so fucked up that people are still annoyed at you now. Why don't you just apologize and get over it? Because people are over it, but they want to hear you say sorry. They want to they want to hear you admit that you did wrong. And he's still making excuses. And if again, if you do your research, there's nothing really to excuse about this. Like maybe he might have a he might have a point to be made about should it have been done that way on the stage blah 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 i don't know whatever he could have some point around that it was bullying mob mentality whatever but the core of the issue was that he was stealing jokes joe rogan's finally stood up for the comedians who felt like they were being you know wrong they were getting bumped as well as the other thing too that he doesn't mention he was bumping people left right and center and then he kind of got a lot of satisfaction he said out of it because people did it to him so he felt um he felt obliged to do it to the next generation of people coming up, which is the most shittiest thing to do. You would imagine, really, the worse you were treated coming up, the more likely you are to be nicer and kinder to the people coming up behind you because you don't want them to repeat the same mistakes. You don't want them to go through what you had went through on, on your way up. And he's still being an entirely, entirely terrible person. And again, you'll get more perspective from this, watching the documentary and also watching the clip itself that I think Brian Redband filmed when it actually first happened. Time. Even to this day, bro. Yeah. Somebody says you stole a joke. I go, okay. Well, what joke was it? Not angry. Like what joke, dude? I write a lot. You know this. I fucking create I, a lot of material. I'm so a genius. Lot. You've seen me. I've got a big brain. You personally have seen me write. I'm really good at comedy. Twenty minutes of new shit on stage in one show. I I, I, I have seen that, but I have also seen um some of your act. You know what I mean? a little too close to things that have already been established like 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 the bill cosby bit yeah i'd never seen that one so i know but i know my, my point though is is that it's so similar right yeah yeah that um why not just outwardly say i apologize and then we could just move on from it rather than you what, what is that like a psychopath thing that kind of lack of emotion because he's not very this is sort of like his career's in tatters, right? He's been basically excommunicated from the comedy scene. He's been, this is the, probably the biggest platform he's been on since the Mark Maron show. I don't think anyone, who else had him on? Was it Joey Diaz maybe had him on? I don't know who else had him on. But he hasn't really been involved in any prominent LA podcast since the Mark Maron show. And that was a bit of a train wreck. So you'd imagine after all this time with COVID, people are a bit emotional, right? You're reaching out to old friends. You want to reconnect with people that you've, you know, lost contact with. If you've lost contact with me, don't reconnect with me. I don't give a shit about you. Drop it and die. But you'd imagine people being a little bit more emotional in that regard, that you'd be a little bit more understanding and maybe a little bit more empathetic, em empath empathetic, 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 whatever that word is. And you just want to maybe turn a new leaf. You'd want to be welcomed back into the fold. But no, he's not defending but it's not that i'm defending see again it, it's not that i'm defending i just who do i apologize to everyone you heard so, you, so really quick really quick yeah I, i'm i'm not and he did that a lot by his way interrupting everybody and you see bobby lee's eyes there look at that <laughs> you and i hung out we we never watched comedy shows there was no netflix to watch it it was nothing and you never heard me talk about bill cosby and yeah, my yeah, style but, of comedy but, is but, nothing yeah, like just, it. no no hold okay. on let me tell you a story so when we recorded that special on the second recording i did that bit at the end of the show jeff schimmel robert schimmel's brother came up to me and said yo that bit sounds very similar to a bit that what's McCall does and i said fuck i'm tired of this shit what's the mccall it does he doesn't even say his name but you guys deal with it the way you need to deal with it from the minute he told me that I've never done that joke ever since. We can go through the archives of my performances. I could take you and you could pull out any performance. This I is such a backward justification. Just because you have the record of every set you've done and you can show evidence that you've never repeated the same joke that you've talking of somebody else when you got called out isn't evidence that you're a good person. It's just evidence that you, when you get called out, you stop telling a joke. Like, bullshit guy. Anyway, it's continued. Another side of the clip that I thought was very illuminating was when Kalila tried to get involved and ask him a question. This was around, what was this? Da, 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 da. This was around 123. Let's scroll through here. 123. It's about here. Yep, there you go. Let's go back here. 123. But I can, you know, look. 
when you're following the 12 step program, which you know well, when it comes time to apologizing, you have to apologize to the people that you hurt. Correct. You can't just give a blanket statement and say, I was a drunk and I was an addict and while I did that, I hurt some people. No, you have to call those fucking people. You have to talk to those people. You have to look at those people in the eye and say, I agree. I'm sorry that I did that to you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. That's what I've always wanted to be able to have that catharsis for myself. Me, me. On behalf of, of me. Me. Yeah. To say to those guys like, dude, I never knew that I did that. I'm so fucking sorry. How can I make it up to you? What are you doing right now in your career? Do you want to open for me? Do you want to do some tour dates? This guy's ego is out of the world. Who wants to open for Carlos Mencia in 2020 going forward? Who would want to do that? Do to help. You know what I mean? I don't have a TV show. But you know what I mean? I'm still fucking doing the road. I still do the numbers. You I know, love we're that. still doing like I would, but I, I, love I that. never get that. And and I wish that I did. And so a, a hypothetical apology, I don't have a problem with it. It feels fake. Mm. Not to me, <laughs> but to, to them. That's always felt fake. Until I, now. Because now I realize that to a lot of people, I am that and that's all I am. And no matter what I say, no matter what I do. And also, he looks like That's pure, utter dog shit, doesn't he? Objectively speaking, right? The triple chin, he looks very bloated, like he's been drinking every single day of his life um, since that occasion. He looks lonely, detached from reality, deluded. Like, there's a quote in that Carlos Mintz, there's a quote in the Comedy Store documentary that really stood out to me, where Joe Rogan says something like, um, I think he's on one of those comedy store shows. I think with one of the guy that kind of dresses up in wacky suits. And he says something like, oh, joke stealing is one of the most, you know, obviously abhorrent things that you can do in comedy. But it's also the curse of all curses that you're going up on stage doing other people's jokes. And you know deep down that that's not your material. You know you didn't write it. And you know the moment you get, you get called out, you're going to have to make new material. But you haven't practiced making new material because you keep stealing. That's basically the, the that is what, what do you say it was? That the, the that's like the curse of all curses or something along that line as Joe Rogan said and it is the curse of all curses that now Carlos Mencia who was you know at first cho he was the one people picked his side because he was the popping comedian at the time Joe Rogan was ostracized then the tables get flipped Joe Rogan becomes the living embodiment of the comedy store he's flying that banner left and right he's a, a big advocate of Missy Shaw and the work that she did there He's providing a platform. He makes the Joe Rogan podcast, which then becomes Joe Rogan Experience, sorry, becomes a platform to showcase some comedians, whether they be established underground, on the way up, regardless of AB. It then becomes the biggest platform outside of Netflix to showcase your talent and to showcase, you know, your ability to be funny and whatever it may be. And then the person that was on top in Cosmos series completely your society is on the outside looking in how the tables have turned if again don't believe in karma too much because i think some people just you know are terrible and they get away with it they live a nice and free life conscious free they go to bed like a baby um you know even though they you know put tons of pollutants in people's water and you know effectively wipe out a complete generation of a family they don't really have any they don't really have any consciousness in that regard some people are like that but he definitely has some level of karmic um you know effects have been felt in his life looking at him in general and how he's basically conducting himself in this interview well fuck those people but it's diff it's difficult because i don't i don't have a problem with you suck you're you ain't shit da, 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 it doesn't matter there is no comeback for whose jokes are you telling now what jokes did you do oh you wrote a new joke like there's no comeback for that you can't you should get i can't say anything to that all I have to, I, all I can do is read it and try to let it not break my heart, mm. crack my soul, you know? But I, in my mind, and maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture, but in my mind. And, I, and again, if I, I fast forward a few minutes, but look how quiet Bobby Lee is. In the beginning of the show, he's super chatty. He's bubbling. They're making, you know, you can see his face here in a corner of the screen. He's really engaging. He's trying to, you know, he's trying to help out his friend. And by the middle, he realizes it's like talking to a brick wall. 
You know, he's got his arms crossed, he's crossed his legs, defensive position. He's looking down, not looking at um, Carlos Mencia. He's completely tapped out. He's realized that this guy is way beyond the pale. He's finished, it's done, it's over for him, it's a wrap. But it's sad to see, of course, because it's your friend and he can't be reasoned with. And Kalila, bless her, is still trying. And this is probably the only podcast, I think, outside of the one that Kalila started crying because she felt ashamed that she wasn't black or something, remember, during the whole uh, Black Lives Matter thing? process are happening in the stage and she started sobbing this is probably the only podcast i've seen outside of that that's got this many dislikes 5.3 um up votes and 1.2 down votes the only one I see the cost of effect. redemption for you and i believe in it so strongly and i think that the where it starts is like you said individually apologizing but doing both doing the blanket statement anyways whether you think it's genuine or not how it lands on people is 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 we can't control that but doing both doing the blanket mm -hmm. and then doing yeah. this and then i see somebody that i grew up with making amends who i know is an amazing performer and i want to see him up on stage again in in the way that he deserves yeah i don't have control over that like i said i you know i've i've called individuals to apologize i've called them to say you know sorry i bumped you sorry i did that you know what i mean the caparillos of the world mm. you know but then again bobby will tell you i never went on stage at the time i was supposed to in the first few years of my career <sighs> anyway this is this is when he gets a little bit ridiculous he starts to make excuses and argue that he was also disadvantaged coming up it's a horrendous interview to car crash tv but again um recommend you check it out um check out the comedy store documentary too um carlos mencia it feels like his career is completely finished if it wasn't before then it definitely is now um i don't think anyone's going to get any sympathy from this at all he basically painted himself out to be an even a much a, a, a way more how did yeah he, he made himself look worse if that's possible 14 years later which is a very rare talent so big up him and regardless and then big up Kalila and bobby lee too for trying to help out their friend but again he's finished he's beyond the pale he's gone he's unreachable it's over it's done um but again let me know in the comments what do you think do you think Carlos Mencia can come back i don't think so i think Carlos Mencia is done out here um but maybe he can make a comeback in your eyes let me know in the comments down below i'd love to hear your opinions Next on the list, what else do we have here? Handy, de, 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 de. what else is here? What else is here? What else is here? What else is here? Oh, yeah, update here. Update on Joseph Caparetti or Cap. Cap Capriati, Joseph Capriati, I say you pronounce his name, Joseph Capriati. Of course, you guys would be familiar. I mentioned it previously on the show that he um, unfortunately um, had a bit of a domestic issue back home where he got into a kerfuffle with his father, which then led to his father inadvertently stabbing him in the chest. Um, luckily, he's on the mend. He's doing well. He's in recovery. And I think he posted a message on his Instagram basically saying that he forgives his father and he would hope that people kind of give his family privacy um, and space and obviously not annoyed them going through this difficult time but this is kind of a uh, an article here from la republica uh, naples i guess based um publication translate to english so don't um kill me for the grammar because obviously it was already in italian can give us some more details on the matter it says the following the clinical condition of the 33 year old internationally renowned dj joseph capretti is slowly improving even if they are still serious hospitalized in the casaretta hospital after being stabbed by his father following a violent domestic dispute that took place on the night between friday and saturday i wonder why they, that's weird it's a weird way to say that in it the grammar of italy they say on the night between instead of just saying friday night um prognosis remains confidential and will be dissolved only tomorrow by the head of the internal surgery department caparetti was wounded in the chest by the blow pierced his lung forcing the doctors of caserita's hospital to carry out an urgent intervention that was successful again he's really fortunate maybe if this was a few months prior um during covid you know i'm not sure how well they would have been able to help him in hospitals i don't know what the kind of admission rate was there I, again it's just if ever there was a time to get stabbed in the chest it'll be now when maybe the number of cases has decreased somewhat and there's basically some room um in hospitals to basically take people that are suffering such you know serious conditions like this but god damn it man what a horrible situation to be in 
Um, da, 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 but the blow pierced his lung. It continues here. The 61 year old father of the DJ arrested for attempted murder and still confined to the military prison in Santa Maria Capu Verde is a retired former police officer, which is a crazy turn. Described as a devastated man for what happened, of course. Um, I said before, and it, it most likely was just a domestic that kind of got out of hand. You know how Mediterranean people are, they're very passionate people. Um, I can, you know, especially with the strain of COVID, it's, that's the thing that people don't realize. I think post COVID, we're going to probably see that maybe in the next five to 10 years, the after effects of this virus and being locked in at home and not being able to kind of do what we normally do in our lives and move around and you know do the things that we kind of enjoy and bloody blah, blah 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 the effects of it are kind of far reaching they go way beyond just the monetary the, the monetary impacts right the job prospects like they impact every single part of your life so i wouldn't be surprised if this is kind of just a an aftershock of consequence of just being locked indoors all the time right you go home you go and you go and you go and stay with your parents because you want to look after them because we're a bit older um you want to basically get away from england for a bit go and reconnect be with your family be next to your friends that you grew up with and sometimes along the way the tensions kind of get frayed you know you haven't been at home for a while i don't know i'm just hypothesizing but i can imagine your scenario just being just the, the the situation that we're in in the world is definitely kind of adding strain to the kind of family dynamic that appears to be there regardless and so again man like if you have friends that are going through a tough time or you know somebody that basically is struggling at home pop over visit them give them a call send them an email send them a text you know talk to them over whatsapp whatever it may be do something because there's people that are suffering in ways that you probably wouldn't imagine and not just like you know i lost my job i don't have a house over my head or whatever roof over my head other other ways are definitely impacting their quality of life it continues here 61 year old is a clean record and he would have been repentant when he was heard by the policeman of the flying squad or of the police department from the point of view of the restructuring what led to the injury all of the pieces have been put in place the quarrel broke out for a few tire reasons it says here so again a, a bullshit argument um it seems first between the dj and the mother with the subsequent intervention of the father it then designated it then degenerated between shoves slaps and punches despite the fact that the same mother and brother of the dj intervened several times to divide the litigants according to what was reconstructed by the police the 33 year old joseph capretti have would have hit his father with a fist punched him in the face basically and then the dad took the knife and plunged it in his chest in a gesture of, of impetus so just uh, he just went red in it he saw red and went crazy but god damn it man how broken was the father be to do this to his son right like the strain like the strain on the family again covid already this on top of it like again thoughts go out to him and his and his family hopefully his friends actual friends are doing what they can to be around them offer support whether it's remotely or there in person he's going to need all of that going forward in it because these sort of things have everlasting effects but you can hope that they kind of bounce back as a family going forward next on the list we have a very poignant article here from the guardian courtesy of annabella ross who wrote some you know who kind of wrote some really good articles concerning the plight of women in dance music and now she's highlighted another prominent woman in techno rebecca who basically has outlined some of the abuse that she suffered coming up in the industry and it's a hard read man i'm not gonna lie it's a very very hard and sobering read but it's definitely necessary at this moment in time especially for uh, especially post covid right there's there needs to be as much as this conversation around inclusion and diversity is great online there definitely needs to be some actionable steps taken so that we can kind of rectify the issues that were kind of dormant right things that people kind of ignored didn't really place any onus on and that basically rid the ugly head from the play graves the lack of diversity and inclusion on lineups to all sorts of manner of things to the underhand tactics of dj fees loads of things have basically been exposed and put out into the open during play during during the during the covid um and we can't ignore them going forward you'd hope going forward once the clubs reopen once festivals are allowed to run again that we've kind of gained a learning from this time that we've taken out you know it's been too long we can't just go back to the same old same old some change will have to be made but speaking about these issues openly you'd hope it's going to drive a conversation and obviously lead to some kind of action so this is an article here from the guardian that says rebecca the last sorry rebecca the techno dj fighting sexual abuse in dance music and it says the following 
DJ Rebecca remembers the day she walked into a record shop in her native Birmingham to ask for a job. Her parents had bought her a set of turntables just before her 17th birthday and she was keen to start building her vinyl collection. She said, I said to the guys working there, oh, have you got any jobs going? She recalls and they replied, yeah, can you, you can give me a blow job. Which, you know, imagine a 17 year old girl, first time getting into the scene and this is what you're met with. And again, like, these are anecdotal stories, of course, but I don't think anyone can deny that you've you've not kind of heard something along these kind of lines from somebody else that you know who happens to be a female in this industry who's kind of navigated through you know especially the early days maybe not maybe not so much now because there's a lot of you know female-led collectives and there's a lot more kind of attention on that sort of thing so people the creeps out there are probably a little bit more careful about how they go on but definitely 10 20 30 years ago this kind of attitude was prominent in the scene and something that people kind of tolerated because it is what it is at that time i guess people were maybe um didn't i almost say didn't know better but it was just that was just part of the culture but then as things started to change as you know you had more female djs come into the industry you had more people behind the scenes kind of not accepting that kind of diabolical attitude um things slowly started to change a little bit but again it takes accountability of everybody in the scene to rectify that sort of issue right you can't have people turning a blind eye to it just because it you know it doesn't impact them in any way shape or form um as we've seen with all these protests that are happening around the world right all these things are sort of all intertwined everything relates to everything it continues here rebecca who's five foot one says she would have looked about 14 at a time i just used that i just used to take it in this my stride she says it took me back a little bit and i was like okay i'm not going to get taken seriously not going to take seriously it's just a common theme throughout my career and you hear that a lot in it with female djs where they kind of have to who is it someone famous did that once right where they made up a male pseudonym for themselves so they, they can get the productions heard in a serious way or they can they can get booked in certain places like it's pretty it's pretty nuts to think how um uh, medieval some of these thinkings are behind in the scenes it continues nearly 25 years later rebecca's one of the europe's leading techno artists respected by her peers industry media and hundreds of thousands of uh, fans who flock to see her play pounding industrial rhythms at clubs and festivals in electronic music female non-binary and transgender users are still far outnumbered by men but today some of the scene's biggest that's stars i woman among them are fellow techno dj Emilia lensard the wit both from belgium where rebecca was starting out in the mid 90s there was not so much role models and no clear path to success which is again part of the issue at, at hand in it um i think this drive or I, I guess the tendency or not tendency um the desire to have like 50 50 representation in dance music can get a bit odd because there isn't i don't think there's there's ever going to be a fair balance in you know certain occupations because you know there's just not going to be enough women to make up 50 percent of the lineup but there definitely needs to be a more of a what you call it diversity in just the terms of people who are playing forget if it's men or women just the same old 10 20 people playing in festivals around the world doesn't serve anyone's purpose especially depending on some of the raves and festivals that you go to you look out on the dance floor you see the amount of different people from all over the world and you look at the stage and it's the same five to ten caucasian faces that you see in every single rave it just gets a bit tiring and boring now going forward the thing that I like more so is that even though I think the whole 50-50 lineup thing is counterproductive, I think it's the first part of actually addressing the issue. Because if you just kind of shoehorn and kind of, you know, crank that shit open with a crowbar and just trying to force the women in there just because you want to get the numbers balanced, it maybe leads to a far more interesting conversation as to how do you program these events to accommodate a more diverse lineup. It doesn't have to be 50-50, but you kind of have to start by just shoving them in there so as much as i was against it in the beginning i think the only way to combat it and to change it is just to kind of force it on the industry because as it is I'm, i've watched way too many panel discussions with people from fabric and big festivals like premier and sound Louis kind of places and essentially what they've said in you know, uncertain terms is that we book the people that sell the tickets but then it's kind of productive because if you're an up coming person that happens to be a female non-binary or transgender you'll be like hey i don't I might not command the ticket sales because I don't necessarily get the push or the marketing drive or I don't get put on the lineups that these guys are getting put on, which is why they're selling tickets. Put me on those lineups. Let me prove myself in front of these audience, gain new fans, and I'll be able to sell tickets for you. But of course, these festivals don't want to take chances. So the only way to do it is to just force these people on these lineups, right? 
transgender female non-binary force them on there make it 50 50 and then whoever swims swims whoever sinks sinks and then you kind of rinse and repeat the next year and then by the by the kind of five-year mark of that plan those lineups will look a far more diverse and far more interesting even as a raver because at the moment you know you go to a time walk festival you go to a you know go to time walk basically and could can you really discern between three or four DJs playing there back to back or not at, during peak times? You probably couldn't tell if it's a DJ even changed sometimes. It's all the same people playing the same old regurgitated shit. And as long as that happens, these sort of like draconian, medieval, um, old school ways of thinking about women in the industry will always exist because those dudes will still be there feeling very comfortable in a way that things were prior but the more you force them in the scene i think it kind of really changes the overall vibe of things you would hope again this is just me from the outside speaking because i don't really have any experience of putting on events of that sort of scale but you'd hope it continues the record shop incident would set a tone for sexism harassment and abuse that rebecca has experienced throughout her career along the way there have also been supportive men who have nurtured and encouraged her she says but for some her passion for music was something to be used against her either as a subject of ridicule or as a means of sexual exploitation as me too stories began to emerge in the dance music scene recent allegations made by derek may which he, he denies and the late eric Mullo, rebecca's career is pocket was very pockmarked with the same patterns of abuse one year after being laughed out the record shop at 17 Rebecca was raped by an acquaintance Jesus Christos who had come around um, under the pretense of teaching her to mix records god damn it at 21 when she started touring internationally as a DJ she believes that she was sexually assaulted by Eastern Europe in Eastern European by a promoter who snuck into a hotel room while she was passed out a few years later in another European country she tried to coerce her into sex she refused him and he never booked her again in either country this is wild wild again man like we have to do better man have to do better <sighs> fuck me it makes me look stupid she says knowing he possibly did the first assault to go back and put myself in that position this is where as a young dj i was kind of ruthless because i would do whatever when i had my eyes on something at cost of myself and you hear this so often i think i heard this um again uh, she's fucking annoying and you know way way too self-absorbed but now she has a really good interview series where she sits down with one girl i forgot her name short brunette lady and she basically talks about her time having to be a um a naked dj she was a naked dj in china for a short period of time right and she that was basically her only way to she thought she had to get into djing she didn't know anything about the scene and she kind of had to go through that really um horrendous exploitative kind of way right to kind of get, get in the industry and she kind of skirted around some of the topics but you do get the idea or you get the impression that she had to had seen some real dark shit when she was playing in these parties basically topless covered in glitter um and uh, some of the people out there were mostly models or some were sex workers or escorts whoever they may be trying to get boost their profile or just earn a bit of money on the side and she was the only person that was legitimately trying to be a dj so you can just imagine how odd that must have been to be in that kind of environment and i think she even mentioned she got paid like i don't know 1000 euros per month or something silly like that to work you know around the clock in these various different locations around china and um yeah like you could just Im and she was really young at that age too that lady so there is a weird under there is a weird scene that exists out there for females coming into the industry that's very very bizarre but again i think it probably isn't as bad as it probably was in the past because there's a lot of female collectives a lot of female-led nights where they try to make the lineups as you know um gender neutral i guess as possible or diverse as possible um they try to basically highlight and provide a platform for the various different people to come through basically outside of the norm that you might see on the mix mag and dj mag top list or whatever it may be and that's the best thing going forward um i i just i, I don't know i don't I, I don't know how else things like these can change behind the scenes apart from the women themselves taking action and deciding to do their own thing because unfortunately i just think this is kind of there's too many patterns and there's too many there's too many similarities in the stories of creeps that leads me to believe that nightlife inherently does attract very um unscrupulous characters people that you probably don't want to you know um introduce to your sister you don't introduce to your niece whatever it may be right it's just part of the game i think unfortunately nightlife just invites to you know just kind of brings out the horribleness in some people so 
if you can't get rid of the monsters because they're always going to exist because they're you know they're thinking they can get away with shit in the dark you have to then empower the females the transgenders the non-binary people to to have the platform to be able to put on their nights have the access to the resources and the funds to put on parties to start labels so they can create a safe space for themselves that then they can kind of branch out to others and invite others to come into but if you let leave them to just kind of navigate the nightlife scene on their own unfortunately this is the result you're going to get you're going to get a 17 year old girl walking into a flipping record shop looking 14 and being told if she wants to work there as an intern labeling vinyl she has to suck the guy's dick behind the flipping stock room it's like fuck me man disgusting um she says yeah it makes me look stupid da, da, da. she did a couple of days ago persisting in the face of the continued disrespect was the norm with female DJs Rebecca recalls rejecting a former booking agent who came into her one night in London and said I can't believe that you're doing this I thought that you put me in the agency because you respect him as a DJ god damn it he was like you're not a DJ I created you you're not a fucking DJ when Rebecca suggested to a legendary US DJ that they worked together in the studio he replied only if you're naked god almighty man again how how interesting that all of these things that she's saying sound very much so sound incredibly similar to another article that I read with the lady that was anonymous and who knows maybe she was an anonymous source I don't know and it also sounds similar to the account of the other ladies alleged crimes against Eric Miller and the ones against Derek May and the other things you might have heard in the scene in general they all sound eerily similar um god damn it sometimes you feel like you need to just like rip the scene up completely burn it to the ground and start again in it because like behind this like away from the stuff that i see week in week out or maybe because i'm just oblivious to it i'm just enjoying the music and having a dance there's some really really unscrupulous characters in the scene in it really really and it's unfortunate too that they happen to be the people that are in power so they get to use that influence and that position to basically lure these women into doing things that they probably wouldn't have done because they're so desperate to get in and to make it because making it in dance music is flipping difficult everyone under the sun can dj it's not hard to put on a night it's not difficult to put together a um yeah it's not hard to put on a night it's not difficult to you know to start to mix or to put out some records ever anyone could do that but to get recognition to be put in a position where you can make a living for yourself is really the touch of god it's really a touch of luck really right um to have access the moment you get signed to a label you know i've spoken about richie ahmed before his kind of trajectory at hot creations was sort of kind of advantageous because you just happen to be around and be a cool guy to hang around with and suddenly he becomes an international dj that's basically all all it is it's all about your network and people that you know so there's a weird thing in the air that they kind of exploit and they use to their advantage because they know that these girls know too that if they do whatever that guy says potentially this could change your career for the better but it's also incredibly incredibly humiliating to just go through that in general right you come into the scene wanting to be taken seriously as a musician and then you're being degraded in this manner on a continual basis no matter how much experience and accolades you have in industry it just keeps happening again and again and again um, her new uniform of jeans t-shirts and trainers also helped Rebecca distance herself from the five year stint working in the adult entertainment industry Bruh, from the age of 19 I was like nobody takes me seriously anyway it doesn't really matter that I'm a model she says I was young I needed the money but it was also a way not to have a full time job to be able to still apply myself to music so what was she then was she like a stripper or something before and then decided to get back to music god damn it man the stigma of having to work as a glamour model made it tougher for Rebecca to gain respect to the peers. So again, look at look how look how destructive this scene is, right? In so, for some people, she comes into the scene once to get taken seriously as an artist, is shunned and pushed out, can't earn any money because you know she doesn't have any experience. Then decides to go into glamour modeling to get money in order to kind of continue doing the things she actually loves. But then doing glamour modeling puts a bit of a stain on her or makes people think that she's a certain way and that negatively affects her going forward so it's just a, a real clusterfuck of a situation isn't it um it continues all the house guys they were never going to take me seriously i was always a dirty one the glamour model what does she know about mixing what's up against her as a, as recently of 2017 after two decades of demonstrating her talents rebecca was accused of faking her dj sets by not mixing tracks live an allegation normally leveled at female djs which was prominently disproved with a performance video 
God almighty. The new crop of female techno sausages lens and they wear have also adopted a casual look, mostly back, black and baggy t-shirts and streetwear and fashion complements. Their austere music distracts attention from their bodies and rebuffs suggestion that they're trading on their looks. It's a fine line to walk for a female artist. So I wonder if that's part of the reason, again, I think it's been, you know, we all kind of have an understanding that maybe Peggy Guru is a bit of a cunt, right? Or you know a console probably is a bad term to use because we don't really use it that same way in the uk but she's not the nicest person to hang around with let's say with peggy goo but i wonder if part of the reason why people are so have such a visceral reaction to her is because she kind of dresses in a more conventionally pretty way right she wears loud colors she wears makeup she puts her hair in different styles dyes it different colors i wonder if that's the reason and then these girls who are kind of a little bit more regimented and a little bit more um uniform 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 leg formal leg i guess in their outfits white baggy t-shirts leggings trainers poor hair pulled back just like playing the music i wonder if that kind of helps them to kind of differentiate themselves from that sort of side of things it's really unfortunate isn't it because you should just be able to wear what the fuck you want to wear if you're gonna go and dj in a ball gown do your thing but i wonder if part of the reason why people don't like peggy is because she dresses more like a girl quote unquote like a girl that's into fashion and streetwear don't get me wrong <laughs> Being a female in the industry is double-edged sword, Rebecca says, in one respect, you get noticed really quickly and things happen really fast, very true. But on the other hand, you might also not be ready for it. You get thrown in the deep end and you just have to survive. Yeah, 100%. Definitely, I can understand that one, innit? Um, because there's not a lot of women at in the industry, especially at the top. Um, if you come through and you're fairly good looking or you have something about you, you'll probably get pushed far in front of people and you probably get pushed to a level you probably shouldn't be at based on your ability and your experience. But fuck it, you know, you, you, you are where you are. You do what you can with the position that you have. But then you also get treated like a bit of a commodity, right? You just get thrown around in places. You get told to stand in front of cars, hold flipping trainers next to your face. And that devalues your in some people's eyes would devalue your credibility as an artist going forward so it's a really really horrible situation to be in um the it's sort of like the more successful you are the more it kind of hurts you if you're a non-male basically it, this way it looks like right when somebody like a what's his name when someone like a richie horton can do any brand collaboration under the sun you can flock simps you know sake barbecue whatever right under the sun and no one bats an eyelid but the moment a, a female dj stands in front of a car everyone goes flipping crazy it's mad after years of merely surviving and now thriving rebecca feels her career is close to its peak even while it's temporarily held back by the pandemic it's from this position of hard won a recognition that she finally felt comfortable to address sexual harassment and assault on electronic music and an issue came to head in September following the death of house pioneer, house superstar Eric Miller, who was eulogized on social media. The rape survivor who pressed the charges was fellow DJ who had held a gig with Marilla, da, 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 we know that. She says, I just went back to I just went back to being the 17 year old Rebecca says it's been 20 odd years and I thought things were in a better place and what we're what we're slut shaming a female DJ who went back to her third DJ's house it made me feel sick of course she described the outrage over the Marilla situation on in Instagram she received a digital messages from young women sharing their experiences of abuse they inspired Rebecca to start a campaign called for the music named for the women and LGBT members of the scene who want to enjoy gigs without being harassed and fear of safety hedonism has always gone hand in hand with clubbing but the seen milieu late nights drinking have also enabled sexual predators to operate in the shadows for decades that's something as well that needs to be stamped out and i guess it's hard isn't it because for my group of friends usually everyone kind of goes out of their way to be as accommodating as they can to girls when they're around because you just want them to hang around with you you don't want to creep anybody out so the last thing you're going to want to be doing is trying to take advantage of them or whatever it may be you want to be as cool as you can so they can come back to yours go do an afters they can invite you back to theirs for an afters whatever they may whatever the situation may be and just in general too especially from the places i've been in out at local places in the east you try your best to be as mm, as neutral as you can when you go out and you're dancing and raving just because you want to build a community right i i don't really you don't not trying to go out to get laid all the time because that's part of your your scene is basically going to see djs play records that you might have been listening to or where you got to go see someone perform in a certain way in a live performance it's less of the kind of hooking up culture which is which is why this sort of stuff is really hard to kind of read because you would imagine okay maybe because i'm so 
detached from the stuff and I don't see it happening because it's you know it doesn't affect me in that regard because I don't know anybody that's kind of gone through this stuff but it's really upsetting to see that this stuff is happening behind the scenes like if you're just a girl that just loves the, the scene and you want to get involved you're essentially putting yourself up you're putting yourself out there for untold amounts of abuse in some way shape or form unless you're fortunate enough to stumble into a good social group you just don't know what you're going to get yourself into and then i guess the responsibility again from people all around ravers included whoever they may be men or women to just kind of look after each other out there in it like that's the main thing like i think i'm a big believer in that you know if you go to like one of those kind of horrible commercial clubs in the high in the city center somewhere and you happen to kind of cross paths with a few creeps that's kind of the name that's sort of like part of the territory right unfortunately if you go to one of these shitty clubs where anyone with money can get in you might come come across some very dodgy characters but i've always been under the illusion or under the idea that if you're part of a scene and you're part of a subculture and private community you should be looked after more when you go out to those nights than you go out to those commercial nights like it shouldn't you should never have a situation where you're kind of fearing for your safety when you go and see someone play in you know in in mixed garage in um in the yard in oval space in what's that what's that place in south called you know phonics these kind of places there should be havens safe havens for you to go and enjoy the music and leave without feeling like you have to kind of cover your vagina do you know what i mean that you would imagine that would be the that would be the thing and i guess maybe with these stories being put out in the open they will basically help to drive a conversation and make guys more aware um you'd really hope so that people kind of take this to heed but again like <sighs> I don't know, man. It's just tough, innit? You'd imagine. Just imagine a young girl. I was just picturing that 17 year old Rebecca going to a store trying to get an internship and then being told that. Like, it's just like, God damn it, people are horrible, innit? People are horrible. It continues Rebecca's call to action was heard. The Association of Electronic Music released an industry code of conduct in November, and other industry bodies have been developing their own pledges to hold abusers accountable for their actions and to create a safer space for clubbers as industry looks to reopen in 2021. As a mentor of young female artists trying to break into electronic music, Rebecca says she feels obliged to continue pushing for change. Can we live with ourselves to keep bringing more women DJs and producers in? knowing that this is going to happen she says i can't and i think we're really strong now this is like an army this has to speak volumes she definitely is true regarding that so yeah hopefully this speaks volumes going forward and we do kind of continue that conversation we do continue to sort of look after each other out on a dance floor because if we don't who else is especially in the uk too i feel like that's the problem we have here because we don't have door pickers we don't have that selection picking thing that they do they have in the continent so it's just a bit difficult do you know what i mean like i don't know man i don't know hopefully 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 the, the message is sort of heated off the back of these um, articles and people make some level of change mm. anyway that's the signature episode number 422 thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's your first time tuning into a show via youtube make sure you smash the like button hit subscribe leave a comment down below if you're simply the podcast that please leave me first so i review and share with your friends and of course support for your patrons always more than welcome at patreon.com for just like a patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o get involved there and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care peace bye